Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this Seashell Trust webinar. Uh, very pleased to be here, and thanks very much to Sharon and colleagues at Seashell Trust for organizing this and for inviting me to give uh, this short series of webinars. This is the second of two this month, uh, looking at the rights and interests of disabled children and young people. The first was on children's issues, and, and this is our session for young people's issues. So 16 to 25, but with a real focus on the 18 to 25 group, those who are um, who have transitioned to adult services. And so in particular, we'll be focusing on the CARE Act, for example, the Mental Capacity Act, issues around adult continuing health care, and so on. But I hope this will be of interest to those who are joining who have um, perhaps slightly younger disabled children or who perhaps might be disabled young people themselves because clearly uh, the transition process is supposed to start um, from at least the age of 14. And one of the things that all the evidence shows is that good transition takes time and requires very careful planning. And that's built in, of course, to the code of practice in relation to education, health and care plans. So this is, is hopefully going to be a session that's re of relevance to quite a wide group of families, um, including those, of course, supported by the Seashore Trust, but I understand the invitation has been circulated far and wide. So it's a welcome to the webinar from wherever you happen to be joining. To introduce myself and um, those who don't know me, I'm Steve Broach. I'm a barrister at 39 Essex Chambers, and I specialize in cases involving disabled children and young people. And that's largely because before I came to the bar, well, quite a while ago now, 12 years ago, I worked in the voluntary sector, including for the National Autistic Society, and most recently um, at the Every Disabled Child Matters campaign based at the Council for Disabled uh, Children. So I've got a long background in disabled children's policy campaigning activity, and uh, that's continued through into my practice at the bar as well. So I'm now going to try and share my screen with you. Oh, before I do, I should say those of you who are new to Zoom, if anyone is new to Zoom still, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A function. And uh, as people will know, that stands for question and answer. And you can please use that to ask me questions and I will try and answer them as we go through. But please do keep the questions short and please do keep them general and about general issues that might affect uh, a wide range perhaps of, of disabled young people and families. If I get asked questions about specific cases, I'm afraid I'm just not going to be able to answer them today. Uh, I can't give legal advice without proper instructions, of course but I can point people to sources of advice, uh, information and support. And I will do that as we go along. So please use the Q&A function for any questions that you may have about the content of the webinar. If there are technical issues or other points you want to raise, you can use the chat function for that. But it's much easier for me if questions go in the Q&A because they come up clearly while I'm sharing my screen, which I am now about to do, having checked that my emails are indeed closed. Here we go. So hopefully you can now all see the slides for today's session. And I'll now go into slideshow. And just to start at the beginning by flagging the lawyer's disclaimer at the bottom of this first slide, that this is uh, clearly a general information session. And one of the things that's obvious about our area, uh, more than almost any other, is how fact specific all the issues are. And for all, every legal rule, there's almost almost always at least one exception. So if you are concerned about the legal position for yourself, your family, then you do need to get case specific advice. And again, I'll talk about where um, that, that advice can be obtained from as we go through. I should also say that a large part of what I'm doing today is really trying to bring to life our book. Quick plug. You see the cover. Disabled Children, a legal handbook available from all good bookshops and also from the Legal Action Group website, where you can buy this lovely hard copy tome and also download the ebook um, for a fee, of course. Or you can go to the Council for Disabled Children website and CDC host all the chapters of the book uh, free of charge as downloads. So you can either look for free at the main body of the book, or if you want the whole thing and you want access to the appendices and the, the one set out the law and so on, then, um, the hard copy or the ebook can be bought from Legal Action Group. So hopefully that um, perhaps can be a shared resource locally or families may be able to get hold of a copy. Uh, but as I said, the, the, key, the key contents, the core contents of the book, which I'm going to be discussing today, are available free of charge on the Council for Disabled Children website. Uh, being asked for a link, the easiest thing to do is just use Google 
or any other popular search engine and just pop disabled children legal handbook into the search field and uh, both the Council for Disabled Children and the Legal Action Group websites will come up. So that's Disabled Children Legal Handbook. Now, those of you who attended the webinar uh, last week where we looked at issues around children um, will have a little bit of repetition today because of course the law and the basics of the law are the same, but I am going to be focusing very much more on the post 16 issues as I've said, uh, and certainly the second half of the talk, and I should have said there's a break, which I can't expect any of you to listen to me bang on about the law for two and a half hours, uh, will be very much new because I didn't talk last time at all about the, the Mental Capacity Act or the Care Act. Uh, and so this first section I'll be focusing on uh, some issues that we did cover last time, but taking them very much more from an older young person's perspective. So first of all, I uh, always have to start with this slide for those who might be new. What are we talking about today? What is the law? Where do you find it? Well, Acts of Parliament, of course, are the main source of law in our system. Uh, people may have spotted that there's a rather controversial bill going through Parliament at the moment in terms of the internal market uh, post-Brexit and whether that will then conflict with international law. The basic rule being that Parliament can make the law whatever it wants it to be. So this principle of parliamentary sovereignty is, is fundamental to our legal system. And in our less highfalutin way, we have a series of different acts of parliament, you might call social welfare legislation, uh, that sets the basic principles for the statutory scheme, and perhaps that's obviously for our area, the Care Act from uh, 2014. And when parliament creates these new laws, it will impose either uh, a duty on the public body or a power to do something. And this is a really fundamental distinction that we always have to keep in mind. Because at a time where budgets are tight, as they have been ever since I left the voluntary sector and have been practicing at the bar, um, then what you need to identify is where are the duties? Where do the duties lie to actually do something as opposed to a mere power which creates a choice for the public body to do it or not? And, and there's no magic here. When Parliament's creating a duty, it uses the words must or shall. It uses mandatory language. If uh, it's creating a power, then the legislation will have the word may in it, because may implies may not, it implies a choice. But the Acts of Parliament really only give you the headlines. Underneath the Acts, you then usually have a whole series often of regulations. And so under the Care Act, there's a whole host of different regulations governing, for example, the eligibility criteria for our social care, uh, the way in which assessments should be carried out, the obligations on advocates and so on. All of that is in the regulations or the regs, as they're often referred to, which are a form of secondary legislation. So secondary legislation is made by ministers under an act of parliament that gives them the power to do so. So parliament says in the of state that you may or you must issue regulations that, for example, set the eligibility criteria for adult social care. And it's often where the most important issues are actually dealt with because the really nitty gritty stuff, how long should something take or what's the threshold for entitlement to services is often dealt with in the regulation. And then there are other forms of secondary legislation as well, rules, directions, orders and so on. Um, or perhaps most notably this summer, the notices that were issued by the Secretary of State which downgraded the duties in relation to the duties in relation to Section 42 of the Children and Families Act on education and health provision in the HC plans, which we can come back to. So all of those are legislation of different types and they're all law. There's no um, wriggle room just because something's in regulations uh, as opposed to in primary legislation, it's still law and it has to be uh, complied with. Um, then in our system, the common law countries, including England and Wales, the case law is also a significant source of law because what the common law does is look to fill in the gaps between bits of legislation and establish certain principles that are uh, supposed to recognise our standards as a civilised society uh, in, and in particular in public law terms um, standards of fairness I'd suggest often come from the common law so there's no statutory duty to act fairly on public bodies. That's imposed by the common law that the, the judges have identified um, in their judgments. And, and so, for example, all of the law on what it means to consult fairly is set out in these judgments of the higher courts. And that's the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the uh, House of Lords, or now the Supreme Court. 
and also the upper tribunal, importantly, in our area, which has the same status as the High Court. And those decisions set a precedent, which means that if the same facts came along, they'd be decided in the same way. But of course, the facts are never quite the same. So there's always the possibility to try and distinguish the previous cases and argue that your case should be decided differently. But that's, those sources of law are really important. One of the problems, though, with the common law is it's not easy to find because it's not all written down in one place. And so in chapter two of our handbook, we've tried to set out the key common law principles for disabled children and young people. Um, for example, the law around fair consultation. And then you can almost draw a line under point two of the slide because guidance is something different. Guidance isn't law. And law trumps guidance and law trumps policy, of course. You know, local areas may say, well, it's not our policy to do X or Y, to which I as a lawyer would say, well, that's all very interesting. But if the law says you have to do it, then you have to do it, no matter what you might decide uh, locally. But guidance doesn't have to be strictly followed in the same way that law does. However, some guidance comes very close to having the status of law, and that is statutory guidance that's issued under an Act of Parliament that, uh, and in particular, guidance the public bodies are expected to act under, as opposed to simply guidance that they have to have regard to. And, and you know the status of the guidance by looking at the Act or hopefully by looking at the introduction to the guidance where it tells you um, what the legal status is. And guidance the public bodies are supposed to act under is guidance they have to follow unless there's a good reason for them not to do so. And I've never had a public body argue that they've got a good reason not to follow guidance. So it, it's as close to being law as you can get. Guidance that they have to have regard to, often that will be codes of practices, for example, is, of course, therefore mandatory in terms of being a relevant consideration. It must be taken into account, but it doesn't have to be strictly followed. And then there's also non-statutory guidance, which will be issued by a, a superior public body, often central government, but it can also be, for example, a royal college or another body, which doesn't have legal force. But it may be so obviously relevant and authoritative and so on that the court will say it has to be taken into account as a matter of common law. And there's a case involving uh, Mr. Ali in the London Borough of Newham, I think it was, where there was an issue around non-compliance with uh, guidance on tactile paving surfaces for people with visual impairments. And the court said in that context, it was unlawful for the London Borough to have not um, followed the guidance because it was so obviously relevant and so obviously authoritative that it, it essentially managed to attain the status of statutory guidance. So the issue of, of what you have to do with guidance isn't straightforward. Again, as always, individual legal advice would be needed to understand precisely what has to be done in relation to any particular piece of guidance. But as a, as a starting point, it's always better, if you can, to look at the law itself. And that's why we try to set out the law in the handbook. And you can also find it on the legislation.gov.uk website. And most of the time, the team there do an amazing job of keeping the law up to date. And so you'll find the amended version of acts, regulations, and, and so on. So I don't see any questions have come in apart from a practical one, which is uh, whether the recording will be made available. And I understand the answer to that question is yes, through the Seashell Trust, of course. So I'll move on then to um, talk about enforcement and how you can get advice and how you can access um, support to make the law a reality, because I'm very well aware that in many cases, uh, reality and local policy doesn't comply with the law. And if there wasn't any way to challenge that, then you may as well not have the law. But we do still have the rule of law in this country, and we do still have a mechanism that you can use to enforce the law, and it's called judicial review. Now, um, judicial review can be quite controversial. There's uh, a, an independent review of judicial review that's been set up by the government um, with a very strong message, I'd suggest, that, um, that, that there's a belief that the judicial, judiciary are going too far. Um, in some cases, in the way that they use judicial review and, and the activist lawyers are challenging government decisions. Um, I, of course, perhaps have a rather different view than that. But in any event, the process is still available and um, it's a process, as the name suggests, of reviewing by the High Court the lawfulness of decisions or policies of public bodies. So it's not an appeal and it's not a merits-based process. It doesn't look at whether the decision that's been taken or the policy that's been set is a good one. It just simply looks at whether it's been it's a lawful one, i.e. has it been set lawfully? Is the process been lawful? 
and is the outcome lawful? And there are two essentially different types of judicial review challenge. So generally and historically, the challenge would have been to the process by which it has been set, failure to consult or failure to consult fairly. Uh, for example, the Court of Appeal is um, going to hand down judgment soon on the challenge to the, the failure, the alleged failure to consult lawfully on the children's social care regulations that were passed during the pandemic um, to amend the statutory scheme for children's social care. The challenge was brought by the charity Article 39. And, and although there were other grounds initially, the only ground that's gone up to the Court of Appeal is whether the consultation was, was fair or not. So that's obviously a, a classic example of what you can call a process challenge. However, you can also challenge the substance of decisions or policies, essentially on two grounds. The traditional ground being that, they are un, that the outcome is unreasonable, which is a high bar. You have to show that it's outside the range of reasonable decisions that was open to the public body. So again, the court would not want to get engaged in a discussion about the merits of the decision or the policy and would accept that public bodies are given jobs by parliament and might reach different decisions. And in order to win a judicial review challenge under the heading of unreasonableness, you'd have to show that the decision was outside that range of reasonable responses that were available to any reasonable public body properly directing themselves to the evidence. The second kind of challenge to the substance of decisions using judicial review would be using the principle of proportionality, which is a principle that comes from uh, human rights law and, and EU law, and involves generally a more intrusive review by the courts of the outcome, and in particular involves asking a series of questions, perhaps the most important of which is whether the outcome strikes a fair balance between the affected individuals who are challenging the decision or the policy and the wider public interest. And that concept of a fair balance is, is central to the idea of proportionality and can evolve a more intrusive standard of review. Although increasingly the courts are saying that unreasonableness review or Wensbury review, as it's sometimes uh, described after an old case, can itself involve um, a sliding scale of consideration by the court. So these are all quite technical issues that public lawyers will be needed to advise on at the point in which you're considering bringing a judicial review claim. But the take home point, I think, is that you can challenge the substance of decisions as well as the process by which they were taken, but um, it's not straightforward to do so. And you're certainly not going to be able to just go to court because you don't like it or you don't think it's right. There has to be a, uh, an identifiable legal error um, that your lawyers can point to. What do you get if you win a judicial review? Well, normally um, you'll get what's called a quashing order where the decision or the policy is, is quashed, it's set aside as if it was never taken and the public body will have to do it again and do it lawfully this time. And so that does mean in principle, they could take the same decision again. And that does sometimes happen, including in cases in our area. But generally speaking, when um, families win judicial review claims, um, it doesn't result in just a delay because there may well be other factors that intervene that mean that the public body doesn't just do it again. So uh, the court, again, will not usually interfere to the extent of telling the public body what to do. But judicial, judicial review does often lead to long term changes and long term benefits to, for the claimants. The court can make what's called a mandatory order requiring certain things to be done, but it will only do that where there's only one lawful outcome. And that's, again, quite rare because of the choice the public bodies are usually given. Um, for example, a mandatory order might be made if there was a failure to secure the provision in a, in a child or young person's EHC plan because the law is so clear, you must do it. But in other cases, for example, if it was in relation to a Care Act, a care and support plan, and that plan was quashed as being unlawful, it would be very unlikely the court would make a mandatory order, perhaps in the interim to hold the ring and make sure the provision was made while the local authority thought again, but very unlikely to make one in the long term. And then perhaps the most important point on this whole slide is the final slide, uh, which says legal aid may be available in the child's name. Of course, we're talking primarily about adults today, those who are over the age of 18. So it's even clearer that legal aid um, will be available in the name of disabled adults. And of course, if they have capacity to bring the claim themselves, that's what they can do uh, and must do. If they lack capacity in the legal sense to bring the claim, then th they will still be able to claim legal aid, but the claim to court can be brought by a family member 
or a friend or another appropriate person acting as the litigation friend or the official solicitor as the litigation friend of last resort. And so it is possible, and I regularly do, bring claims on behalf of disabled young people um, funded by legal aid. Because the problem with judicial review is not just that you have to pay your own lawyers because arrangements can be made there, but that also you have to face the other side's legal costs if you lose. And that's what puts off people from bringing judicial review claims, the threat of having to pay tens of thousands of pounds potentially in adverse costs if the claim fails. But legal aid comes with uh, what's called cost protection. It's not a complete shield. But in practice, I've never known anyone who had a legal aid certificate have to actually pay the other side's costs. And so, again, advice will be needed from specialist solicitors with the right legal aid contract. But legal aid is the way in which most of these claims come to court. So where are you going to find um, your legal aid solicitor? Well, there's not that many around, of course, and it does need to be a specialist. On my blog, which is Rights in Reality, if you search Rights in Reality and then Solicitors, you'll get a list of those firms who I've worked with um, and their contact details, but also you may be able to identify other options by asking around, uh, by speaking to those uh, to local groups and so on. I should say, of course, the vast majority of disputes don't go as far as judicial review. And there are lots of very important sources of local advice and support, such as the, the local Sendias services, uh, local charities, and also uh, national level groups like IPSI, SOS SCN and others who will provide um, support with dispute resolution well before the case go, has to go to anywhere near the High Court. Having said that, it is important that judicial review claims have progressed quickly because they have to be brought promptly and no later than three months after the grounds of claim first arose. So my general steer would be get advice as quickly as possible. You don't want to go rushing off to the High Court as a first resort because you'll have permission to apply for judicial review refused if you do. But at the same time, you don't want to wait months and months before getting advice. And there have been lots of cases I've been involved in, sadly, where um, it, it, they waited too long. People have waited too long to get advice. And it's become much more difficult to resolve the problem than it would have been um, with some early expert advice. Uh, a few questions that are on this. First of all, do you have an appointed person, either an attorney or a deputy, to bring a judicial review claim at the litigation friend of a disabled adult? Uh, the answer to that is no, you do not. Um, any person can act as litigation friend. You have to fill in a certificate of suitability, confirm that you have no adverse interests and that you'll act properly and so on. But you don't have to have any formal legal status in order to be uh, a litigation friend. Um, and then how extensive a role can a litigation friend have in supporting a disabled young person in everyday life? Or is the role exclusive to legal type issues? So the litigation friend role is all about litigation, as the name suggests. But what I'm going to be discussing uh, as we go forward are the uh, concepts of, of attorneyship and um, deputyship, which are the roles that allow um, family members or loved ones to support disabled young adults uh, under the Mental Capacity Act. So I'll come back to that uh, a bit later on. So I hope that's useful as an introduction in terms of where are you going to be able to access advice and support from and what's the mechanism ultimately by which you can bring challenges. I should also mention at this point, of course, there are complaints processes under all the statutory schemes, which ultimately end up in uh, the Ombudsman, either the local government Ombudsman or the Parliamentary and Health Services Ombudsman. And people can get very effective remedies from Ombudsman complaints. Uh, we've recently shown, for example, that um, a complaint about the conduct of a local authority around a um, dispute on an EHC plan was something that the Ombudsman should be investigating and wasn't appropriate to be left. Um, just to the tribunal. If you're interested in that, um, then Owen Mitchell's solicitors put out a press release about that yesterday, um, a case that, I, again, I was instructed on. So the Ombudsman does have quite a wide remit, but I would suggest that where you've got a really serious and urgent issue, the Ombudsman isn't the right way to go. Judicial review is the right way to go because the High Court can give what's called interim relief and also can make a, a series of legal orders that just aren't available to the Ombudsman. Whereas what the Ombudsman can do that's very effective is, is um, recommend compensation, financial compensation, money, which it can be very appropriate in case where things have gone wrong in the past um, and can also recommend changes to policies and practice and so on. And most of the Ombudsman's recommendations are complied with. So again, it's an issue you'll need to take advice on is whether your dispute is appropriately progressed by way of judicial review or if you'd be better off using 
the complaints process or some other legal mechanism, a damages claim in the county court, for example, an appeal to the tribunal if one exists. There are lots of different remedies and you'll need specialist advice on the facts of your own case. So moving on then to think a bit more about the substantive law, and I always start the substantive legal discussion with um, consideration of discrimination issues, because I think most of the time, or perhaps not most, but a significant proportion of the time, the legal answer to the problems that disabled young people are facing is that they're being discriminated against unlawfully. And we have now a single act of parliament, the Equality Act, that prescribes a series of types of prohibited conduct, i.e. unlawful discrimination. And I'm going to trot through those in a moment. In relation to different protected characteristics, and of course we all have certain protected characteristics, such as age and sex, but there's also the protected characteristic of disability, which not everyone has. And you only um, benefit from that protected characteristic if you meet the definition in section six of the Equality Act, uh, substantial long-term um, physical or mental impairment, etc. Most of the time that, that question is not in dispute and it will be quite clear that the person is disabled if they are considering bringing a claim of disability discrimination. And the types of discrimination include firstly direct discrimination, which is where someone is treated less favorably because they are in our case a disabled person. Now hopefully that's relatively rare. Direct discrimination, if it comes up, can't be justified. So the alleged discriminator can't explain and justify why they're doing this thing. So it's a very powerful form of discrimination, but hopefully quite rare. Much more common, I'd suggest, is indirect discrimination, where you've got a policy or a practice which applies broadly, perhaps to everyone in a particular area or a particular group, um, but it has a disproportionate adverse effect on, for our example, disabled young people in a way that can't be justified. So take, for example, a college that has imposed a zero tolerance behavior policy. Any bad behavior results in a sanction and possibly in, in exclusion. Now that isn't directly discriminating against anyone because the whole point is the policy applies to all students. But it might indirectly discriminate against disabled young people because they will find it much more difficult to comply with such a strict policy. And if there aren't genuinely any exceptions, if it really is a zero tolerance policy, then that may well result in indirect discrimination unless the college can justify the policy as being a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So that's the test that the alleged discriminator will have to show that what they're doing is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Now the legitimate aim will be maintaining high standards of behavior, fair enough. So the question, the legal question will be, is this policy a proportionate means of achieving that aim? And my suggested answer is no, it won't be because there will be other more proportionate measures that could be taken that recognize that some young people have uh, difficulty complying with certain behavioral standards um, without having to have such a blanket approach. So where you've got blanket policies that cause detriment to disabled young people, that's when you're thinking about the possibility of, of indirect discrimination. Discrimination arising from disability only applies as the name suggests to the protected characteristic of disability. And this is where someone's treated less favorably because of something arising in consequence of their disability, for example, their behavior. So if a college was to exclude a disabled young person because they had kicked off um, because they were made to queue for lunch and they couldn't manage the stress, uh, and it was the behavior of throwing their lunch tray up in the air um, or shouting at a teacher or whatever it was that led them to be excluded, then the claim would be discrimination arising from disability. And again, the college would have to show but the treatment or the policy was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. And importantly, that now applies even if the um, behavior amounts to what's described as physical abuse. There is a rule under the Equality Act that a tendency to physical abuse is not a disability. And so people are having discrimination claims struck out or being told they couldn't bring one because they, their behavior was uh, physically aggressive. But in a case I was involved in, um, brought by Mr. and Mrs. C and supported by the Equality and Human Rights Commission a few years back now, we showed that that rule has been misinterpreted in relation to children's school. And I would suggest that would apply equally to young people at college and other settings. And if the behavior resulted from a recognized impairment such as autism, uh, but not limited to autism, then um, the claim could continue, even if there had been physical aggression. 
So don't um, be put off if you're told, oh no, you can't bring a claim because your young person has a tendency to physical abuse. That may well be wrong. And again, individual advice will be needed. And then the most, perhaps the most powerful of the forms of discrimination is the reasonable adjustments duty, because it's a positive duty to make the world a more accessible place for disabled young people. And I'll talk about that a little more in the education context uh, as we go forward. Um, so a couple of questions that have come on. Uh, first of all, what about if the public body refuses to acknowledge the extent of a person's disability, for example, mental health issues? Well, yes, in those cases, some evidence will be needed. And so you don't have to have a formal diagnosis to be a disabled person and have um, the protection of the Equality Act, but you do need that it to be accepted that there is a mental impairment in this case, even if the precise form of that impairment isn't known. So yes, evidence will be required. And again, that will be a case of getting individual advice. Um, and a, a point about the previous slide in relation to legal aid, the legal aid agency aren't always aware that children can be, get, can be granted legal aid in this way. It's not simple to apply. Um, fair enough, absolutely trying to deal with the legal aid agency is, uh, can be extremely difficult. The short point is, um, it's not for you as families to, to have to worry about that. Um, legal aid solicitors will have the expertise needed to be able to obtain legal aid. And so what you need to do as a family is make sure you're with some very good quality specialist solicitors who understand the legal aid system and know how to maximise the chances of getting legal aid in place. Something on the chat as well. Um, the, the point that's just been made on the chat, I'm very sorry to say it's going to be too specific for me to answer. So just to remind people that I'm not going to be able to answer individual case uh, questions or, or respond to individual cases today. If you do have issues about your own situation, your own family situation, then please do try one of the sources of advice and support, whether that's Sendias, uh, charities or a, a legal aid solicitor, including those on my blog. So that's rights in reality, solicitors as the search term. Um, and then uh, coming back to the discrimination issue, a point about if an independent school does an academic entry assessment for all children, could that be indirect discrimination for a child with, with ASD because it's more difficult? Well, that's really interesting. On a related point, the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, has been publicising recently, uh, and the RNIB, a successful challenge to grammar schools whose um, entry exams were not um, adjusted to take into account the needs of children with visual impairments. So certainly in the scope of the reasonable adjustments duty and possibly indirect discrimination. But at the same time, the Act does allow for academic standards to be maintained. So just the fact that there is an academic entry test is not going to be discriminatory on, on itself. But the way the test is administered or the precise requirements of the test could be discriminatory, um, particularly where uh, they can't be justified. And so again, individual advice uh, would be needed. So then um, moving on to look at the second half of this slide, there's a very important human rights principle here as well. So I'm introducing the concept of, of human rights and its relevance to our disabled young people now. And in Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights, there is a non-discrimination provision. So no one should be discriminated against in the enjoyment of their other human rights. So what, what other human rights are we talking about? Well, we're likely to be talking about Article 8 of the European Convention which is the right to respect for family life and private life, amongst other things. Now, your family life, fairly obvious, you're the people who are closest to you that you associate with. Your private life, though, that's not quite as obvious because it might just be seen uh, as being your privacy, but it's not as much more than that. Your private life includes your physical and psychological integrity, your, your well-being, and also your ability to function socially. So it's quite a broad concept, private life, under Article 8. And that means that you can very often argue that issues are discriminating against you and violating your human rights um, because it's within the ambit of Article 8. It's linked to the rights protected by Article 8, including people's private rights. And so for an example of that, a case where we're seeking permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, uh, brought by the Drexler family against Leicestershire County Council in relation to their post-16 school transport policy, uh, which it's argued discriminates on grounds of well, initially we argued it discrimination on grounds of disability and age, contrary to Article 14 of the European Convention, read with Article 8. And the High Court found that both those kinds of discrimination uh, were not made out because it was the differential impact was justified. 
And we appealed on age discrimination to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal rejected that appeal. So the question is whether the Supreme Court will hear it now. So that challenge hasn't succeeded, but it was an example of using human rights law to challenge um, policies which were disadvantageous to disabled young people. And it is perhaps worth noting that in, um, in that case, and, and it may well be, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that this is a result of the judicial review claim, Leicestershire haven't actually yet brought in their new policy and young people are continuing to benefit from the previous more generous policy, um, depending on perhaps the outcome of the appeal or perhaps it's simply just the next academic year, um, but, but the changes have not yet been made. So to think a little more about human rights issues, we need to focus on not just the European Convention on Human Rights, and this is uh, the point where I need to say, this has nothing to do with Brexit. The European Convention on Human Rights is an instrument of the Council of Europe, which we and almost every other European country is still signed up to. And importantly, it's part of English law, English and Welsh law, because of the Human Rights Act. That's what the Human Rights Act does. It makes the European Convention on Human Rights part of our law and says through section six of that Act that no public body can act um, contrary to our human rights unless limited exceptions apply. So for example, that they're required to do so by primary legislation. So the European Convention on Human Rights is key, and that's where we get all the really fundamental rights from. Lord Bingham famously saying, which of these rights would we want to do without? The right to liberty, the right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment, uh, the right to life, most fundamentally, in Article 2. But there are other very important international conventions as well. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, of course, for disabled children, very important up to the age of 18. But for our purposes, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, the CRPD, which is the newest of the human rights uh, conventions from the UN, and is very, very important in terms of embod in embedding the social model of disability and, and a rights focus on how disabled young people are treated. And I've just picked out one of the convention rights from uh, the CRPD to talk about a little more. I was going to go and show you the whole of the convention, but we're just not going to have time to cover that um, in our session today. But do please Google it if you have time and have a look through all the different rights that are covered by the CRPD. And what Article 19 describes is a right to independent living and community inclusion. Now, it's often thought of as being about the right to independent living, but it's more than that. It says independent living and community inclusion. And so the headline is the equal right of all disabled people or persons with disabilities in the UN's language, to live in the community with choices equal to others. So obviously that's an anti-institutionalization provision, but also very importantly, this concept of choices equal to others. So disabled young people having the opportunity to choose their place of residence and where and with whom they live on an equal basis with others and not being obliged to live in a particular living arrangement. How many disabled young people genuinely have the same choices as to where they live as their non-disabled peers? I would say very, very few. And of course, quite a lot are obliged to live in particular living arrangements, either because they're subject to detention under the Mental Health Act or because they have been deprived of their liberty and that's been approved under the Mental Capacity Act, which we'll come on to. And of course, anything that Parliament says um, trumps Article 19. But where there isn't a parliamentary or legislative requirement for a person to live in a particular place. Article 19 should be given its full force. And so when decisions are being taken about care and support for disabled young people, when they're moving on from home or leaving college, it's really important, I suggest, that Article 19 is, is in the mix and is given proper weight and consideration. And um, that right to live in the community, first of all, with secondly, with choices equal to others, it is properly respected. There's a couple of questions. Um, so I've answered the question about Brexit. Yes, the ECHR will still be fully applicable in the UK after Brexit. Brexit makes no difference to our rights under the Human Rights Act. Um, there ha has been another newspaper front page saying that uh, the government is intending to review the Human Rights Act, but unless and until Parliament makes any changes, it remains fully in force. Um, and coming back to my theme of indirect discrimination, the question is if a school has a behaviour policy, stating a child was sent who cannot follow social distance rules will not be allowed to attend. Could this be indirect discrimination? Yes, it could, absolutely. Um, because that policy of saying children who, who attend must follow social distancing rules is a blanket policy that applies to everyone. 
it disproportionately adversely affects children with SEND generally and this child with SEND in particular. And so the school would have to justify it. Now, of course, there is a clear public health justification at the moment, but is such a blanket policy necessary? Are there adjustments that could be made that would allow the child to attend? And of course, if the child has an EHC plan that names the school, they've got a duty to admit the child as well. So yes, that's definitely a case that would be worth uh, taking advice on. Uh, an excellent question um, that's asked about Article 19 of the CRPD that's still on the slide. Is it part of English law? Well, no, not formally, because it's not one of the rights that's mentioned in the Human Rights Act. But increasingly, the courts are taking account of the international conventions in a number of different ways. So for example, in interpreting the European Convention rights, they will have regard to what the relevant international conventions say. In interpreting any ambiguity in domestic law, they'll try and find an interpretation that best fits with the international conventions and in developing the common law as well. So it's a complex picture, but I am increasingly um, using with some success the international conventions in legal arguments. And I would say, refer to the conventions, rely on them, and if people say, oh, we don't have to do it because it's not part of the law, that's when you're going to need to get advice. Um, a question about Article 19 and whether it can be used to argue the other way around, being, uh, not being obliged to live in adult supported living if residential care was more suitable. Yes, absolutely. So the, um, the point that um, of not being forced into particular provision applies to all kinds of provisions. And so it's having choices, choices that is the same as the choices other people enjoy and not being forced to live in any particular place or type of accommodation. Um, a question I don't really understand, what about if the young person doesn't have capacity? Perhaps that's about the choices issue. Well, the, the CRPD doesn't, doesn't actually recognize um, lack of capacity in that respect. It would definitely be an issue in domestic law, but even if the person can't formally choose then their wishes and feelings should still be given very significant weight. And we'll come back to that when we get to uh, the mental capacity slide. Um, a question about EU law when we leave the EU, is it still relevant? Uh, I think I'm going to have to say in substance and that's beyond the scope of this talk, in short, there are transitional measures in place, but until we know whether there's going to be a formal deal or not, I don't think anyone can say with any certainty what the answer to that question is. What I can say though, is that in my practice, EU law is very rarely relevant to the issues that affect um, disabled young children and young people in terms of education, health and social care. So it's unlikely to make a massive change to the legal picture for our children and young people. Uh, the rights under the EU social charter will go, but we, we rarely refer to those anyway. It's much more important, in my, I would suggest, that we keep the ECHR and we keep the Human Rights Act. Those are the rights that we um, refer to. And if possible, follow the model in Scotland of incorporating the other international conventions. So Scotland's in the process of incorporating the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Wales has already um, passed the legal requirement to have regard to the Children's Convention. And the same thing needs to happen for the Disability Convention and in England, the Children's Convention as well. So there is there's opportunity there, um, but the threat in terms of rights and, and leaving the EU is, is not particularly in our area, I'd suggest. Um, question about behaviour policies that give demerits and detentions for inappropriate behaviour and non-compliance. Would that be indirectly discriminatory? Again, yes, quite possibly yes. You'd need advice about whether it is in fact. Is it capable of being indirectly discriminatory? Definitely. Uh, and so would the opposite um, form of policy where uh, someone gets a benefit from 100% attendance, for example. We've even seen uh, examples of policies where Children and young people get to go to lunch first if they can achieve 100% attendance, which comes a bit too close to Lord of the Flies, for my taste. Uh, and again, it's very hard to justify, I suggest, if it doesn't recognise that many disabled young people just won't be able to achieve 100% attendance because they have to have hospital appointments or they're not well enough to go to school every day. And that's no fault of their own. Um, and a similar question about transport policies. Uh, you can only get travel, travelling mentoring if you have a travel plan. Um, is it discriminatory towards those who don't qualify for travel support? Potentially, yes, but of course, not qualifying for travel support is not a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. So you might be arguing that it's indirectly discriminatory against certain groups of disabled people, for example, because you can have to indirect discrimination against certain cohorts of disabled people. It doesn't have to be in relation to all disabled people. 
I think that's um, answered all the questions so far. Moving on again uh, through the slides on human rights issues, um, very important principle of participation that embeds itself in all of the international conventions, this idea of nothing about us without us, and perhaps most importantly, for our purposes, the general principle of participation in Article 3 of, of the CRPD. But it actually also finds expression in Article 8 of the ECHR, which is part of English law through the Human Rights Act, of course. There's an implied procedural obligation under Article 8 that when public bodies are taking decisions that affect people and impact on their private life or their family life or their home, they, that people have a right to be heard. And so in my view, the way that some public bodies use panels to make decisions where the voice of the disabled young person or the family is, is pretty much completely excluded is very unlikely to be lawful because it doesn't comply with this principle of participation under Article 8. And panels which are used to moderate or to um, ensure appropriate decisions are taken as a check may well be acceptable. And that's certainly how they're referred to in the care and support statutory guidance. The panels where the decision goes off to panel and then it comes back with a different level of care or a different placement in the EHC plan without any real explanation or without any real um, sense of engagement with the family's own views or the young person's views may well be challengeable and um, I would suggest advice gets sought in those kinds of cases. Now some of these principles are expressed in, in domestic law as well perhaps most importantly in the public sector equality duty in section 149 of the Equality Act 2010. So as well as all the substantive non-discrimination provisions, the Equality Act also contains this public sector equality duty, the PSED, as it's referred to. And I can't think really of a case where there's been a strategic challenge to a public body around the disability area, where the PSED hasn't at least been mentioned if it, if it wasn't one of the central grounds of challenge. It's a duty to have due regard to a series of specified needs whenever a public body is carrying out their functions. So that's one of the reasons why it's so frequently used is because it's always in play in anything the public bodies do. And those needs include the need to eliminate discrimination suffered by particular groups, but also importantly, the need to advance equality of opportunity for protected groups. So does this measure, does this policy advance equality of opportunity for protected groups? And the high point of the case law on the PSED is probably still the Court of Appeals decision in Bracken, which was the challenge to the closure of the independent living fund that used to support some uh, disabled people with high levels of need to live independently in the community. And the Court of Appeal found that the Minister for Disabled People at the time hadn't properly understood the impact, the implications of the decision that she was going to take to close the fund and hadn't been properly briefed by her officials and had therefore failed to comply with the public sector equality duty. I think it's fair to say that in recent times, the courts have been taking a more lenient approach to the public sector equality duty. And where there's some form of equality impact assessment and some attempt to consider these needs, uh, the courts have been very reluctant to interfere with decisions on the basis of a failure to comply with the PSCD. Uh, it may be that the high point of the PSCD case law has, has come and gone, but the law still remains in force. And it's very important that if there is, for example, no equality impact assessment in relation to a controversial measure or a controversial decision, that, uh, that that's challenged. And again, the legal advice is taken. Uh, if there is an EIA, of course, the duty is not to carry out an equality impact assessment, it's to have due regard to these needs. And so you need to look at what the document actually says, not enough just to have something that's got equality impact assessment on the cover, it's got to actually comply with the legal duty. Um, Moving on then into the Children and Families Act scheme. Now, I'll take this relatively quickly um, on this occasion. It is, of course, highly relevant still for disabled young people because um, the EHC plans now extend to the age of 25, at least potentially. So unlike the old statements of SEN that lapsed when the person left school, EHC plans will move on with the disabled young person into further education, but not higher education. If the person's going to university, they can't keep their EHC plan. So first of all, what's, what's the point of all this? What are we aiming for? It's very important not to lose sight of what section 19 says about the need for local authorities to help young people achieve the best possible educational and other outcomes. So that's the goal, that's the aspiration that local authorities should be aiming for, and that's what public bodies uh, should be measured against, I'd suggest. Are they helping 
young people achieve the best possible educational and other outcomes. And of course, possible does take into account the resources that are available. Uh, some definitions that I hope are not unfamiliar. First of all, what is having a special educational need? It involves a learning difficulty or a disability that calls for special educational provision, which is itself provision that's additional to or different from that made generally for others of the same age in mainstream schools in England, colleges as well, of course. I was asked a really interesting question the other day, which is, well, if what's being done in mainstream schools across the country generally is changing as a result of the pandemic, does that mean that the threshold for what constitutes special educational provision and potentially for when an EHC plan is needed will change? And I think the answer to that is probably yes, because very deliberately Parliament has drawn the comparator wider here than under the previous scheme. So you need to look at what's done generally across the country. And if that is changing as a result of, for example, a global pandemic, then that will change the threshold and the bar for statutory provision for children with special educational needs. So watch this space for a possible up or tribunal decision about that in, in due course. Final point on the slide I suggest is very important. Any healthcare provision or social care provision in the EHC plan context, which as a matter of fact, educates or trains the child or young person, becomes special educational provision and goes in section F of the EHC plan. So that means almost all therapy services, for example, should be in section F of the plan and therefore are the responsibility of the local authority to secure rather than the NHS in the form of a clinical commissioning group. So there's a very, very heavy education bias in the statutory scheme in the Children and Families Act. And that includes making provision which would normally be health or social care, something that's the responsibility of education to secure and therefore, unless any other local arrangements are in place, to fund. Now that does create a problem when the young person leaves education and loses the benefit of the EHC plan. Because for example, therapy services that they've been receiving, perhaps since they were in primary school, um, will now stop unless the NHS decides to carry on providing it. And so those issues need to be grappled with in good time before uh, the EHC plan comes to an end. There's a health and social care divide for disabled children as well. Just mention this because our focus of course is on the older group. But there are some services which local authorities can't provide to children where there's a very high level of nursing care. Local authorities are not allowed to act as a substitute NHS for children. But as we'll see, the dividing line for adults between health and social care is much uh, clearer. Um, so I will deal with later because they're about the detail of the EHC plan scheme, which I haven't yet covered. So just uh, hang on until we've got through the HCP scheme, and I'll, I'll pick those questions back up. So most disabled young people, of course, will be supported by their school or college, and the SEN support process of assessment, planning, delivery, and review is set out in the SEND Code of Practice, with funding that, that comes into the school or college to help deliver that. Very importantly, the governor's best endeavours duty on schools uh, on setting means that the institution itself has to use its best endeavours to meet any special educational needs that one of the pupils has. And so it's not acceptable for um, settings to simply say, well, we're going to make a referral for an EHC plan and that's, that's our job done. That's clearly not right. And they will have to uh, make what provision they can um, using their best endeavours, um, unless and until the EHC plan is put in place and then the responsibility falls on the local authority. Um, and I should be clear, I'm just checking as we speak, that this duty 66 applies also to institutions within the further education sector. So it's not just a school's duty, it also applies to FE colleges as well. So it's very important that that's kept in mind and the challenges are um, made, perhaps informally in the first instance, to the setting, the school or college, um, if, if provision should be made that isn't being made, because the best endeavours duty is a very significant uh, duty that um, requires the school or college to do everything practicable to provide the service that's needed. And that links, of course, to the reasonable adjustments duty as well. And it may well be that a certain thing, a certain type of support could be provided either as a reasonable adjustment, because the duty to make reasonable adjustments includes auxiliary aids and services, or um, under the SCN scheme, 
either through the Section 66 duty or an EHC plan. So what about the reasonable adjustments duty? Well, as I just mentioned, it covers policies, provision criteria and practices, and the provision of auxiliary aids and services. And one thing to note is that services uh, can include people. And so it could be a reasonable adjustment to provide an additional support worker, for example. Now I'm often asked, well, what is a reasonable adjustment? And unfortunately the answer is, it's an adjustment that is reasonable. There's no fixed definition of, of what is a reasonable adjustment. There's some guidance, there's technical guidance for schools and, and colleges that will help you understand what a reasonable adjustment might look like. But it's anything that it would be reasonable for, for the school or college to do that would remove a substantial disadvantage that disabled children or young people are facing. And it's an anticipatory duty. So, that, so the settings are supposed to anticipate people's needs, not just wait for requests for adjustment to be made. Any reasonable adjustment must be free of charge, but the cost of making it is relevant to whether or not it's reasonable. And there's an important accessibility planning duty as well in terms of physical features. So the reasonable adjustments duty, certainly for schools, covers um, auxiliary aids and services and policies. What do you do if you think there's been a breach of this duty? Well, first of all, in relation to schools, you'd appeal to the first tier tribunal, the, the disc bit of Sendisk. For colleges, the remedy would be a claim in the county court, and that's more problematic in a sense, because there's an adverse cost risk in the county court. So it's particularly important that advice is obtained there. Um, although you can, of course, potentially recover costs as well, and also, uh, I believe, get damages awarded, which the tribunal can't do. And in any claim of that sort, you'd be also looking whether there's been discrimination arising from disability and or indirect discrimination as well. The, the Equality Act is quite technical and it's particularly important, I'd suggest, that before you bring any claim for discrimination, you get specialist advice to formulate the claim properly and make sure it's pleaded properly in, in, in the, the jargon, while bearing in mind that there are strict time limits as well. And so again, don't hang around, get advice as soon as you can. Just pause there to have a quick review of the questions. Um, is the best endeavour of duty a statutory duty? In fact, are all duties statutory? So um, if we go back to the very first slide, any duty that's imposed by legislation is a statutory duty. Uh, the common law also imposes duties on public bodies, like the duty to consult fairly, and they, are, they have the same legal effect. But a statutory duty is one that's imposed either by an act of parliament or in regulations or in another form of secondary uh, legislation. Um, would the use of clear face masks be a reasonable adjustment in set schools and settings at the moment? Quite possibly yes, because it's a great example of something that would, could be provided that would be of relatively little cost or disruption to the institution, but could have a massive benefit for certain groups of disabled uh, children and young people. So that's exactly the kind of thing where the reasonable adjustments duty uh, might bite. Um, does the accessibility policy have to cover access to the curriculum and exams? No, the accessibility policy for schools is around physical features, but those issues around access to the curriculum and exams are absolutely within the scope of the reasonable adjustments duty for schools and colleges. Um, I'll pick up a couple of other questions that have come in a little later on because we haven't covered those issues yet. Uh, school exclusions, which of course for purposes of today is perhaps also college exclusions. I think that the short point here is that although there is a power to exclude disabled children and young people, there's a very real chance that any exclusion of a disabled child or young person will result in disability discrimination of one form or another. And so I suggest that particularly where the child or young person has an EHCP, but also in other cases, advice is taken if a, either a fixed term or particularly a permanent exclusion is made, because there could well be um, indirect discrimination or discrimination arising from disability by the exclusion decision and or a failure to make reasonable adjustments in the run-up to the decision in terms of inappropriate provision being made or um, requirements being imposed that, that couldn't be met by the disabled child or young person. So although you can also appeal exclusions, for example, to the independent repeal, uh, review panel in relation to schools, um, it may well be that a, dis a disability discrimination claim uh, is more effective. Um, so a question that's coming about, what about young people who are outside of an educational establishment uh, with a bespoke programme using independent tutors? Does the local authority have additional duties to address the gaps that an education establishment would typically fill? Well, that would be much more straightforward if we had a child who was of compulsory school age, because Section 19 
the Education Act would apply, but that stops at, at roughly 16. So for young people, you'd be looking, first of all, is there an EHC plan that specifies additional provision? Or if there isn't, is there a social care obligation to provide, to fill in the gaps, to use the phrase of the question? Um, and uh, that will be determined as we'll see through the assessment and care and support plan process under the CARE Act. So I'll keep going until about 10 past 11 and then we'll take our own short break uh, to coin a phrase. So in terms of children's social care, just to mention this uh, this time, um, every child up to the age of 18 who is disabled is a child in need and therefore entitled to an assessment under Section 17 of the Children Act 1989 and the Working Together to Safeguard Children Statutory Guidance. Uh, there's a, a fixed time scale of a maximum of 45 working days for the completion of that assessment under the guidance at least. And where there is going to be services provided, they have to be set out in a child in need plan. The problem with Section 17 of the Children Act is it doesn't impose a specific duty to provide services to children in need. But the currently Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970 does for disabled children, used to apply for disabled adults, but was abolished for adults when the CARE Act came in. And the way the 1970 Act works is it sets out a list of services and tells local authorities they have to decide whether it's necessary to meet the child's needs to provide one or more of those services. And local authorities can have eligibility criteria. They can take account of their resources when they're deciding what it means for it to be necessary to provide a service. But once they've accepted the child's got eligible needs, they must then provide a sufficient level of service to meet that need, regardless of the cost. And the way in which they're supposed to decide whether or not the child has eligible needs is through doing an assessment under the Children Act. So there's a child in need assessment carried out and, and once that assessment has been completed, the local authority then has the information to decide whether it's necessary to provide services under the 1970 Act. That's the legal requirement. Whether that's actually done in practice is another question and I think sadly too often uh, the answer is no. Also to mention briefly at this stage uh, the right to uh, or the requirements in relation to short breaks for parent carers of disabled children again up to the age of 18. Short breaks, as we see from regulation three of the relevant regulations, being a service that essentially promotes ordinary lives for families of disabled children. A requirement to have a sufficient level of service to meet local need and to set out what that service will look like in the short break services statement, which is the key document to get hold of if you're interested in short breaks. And importantly, residential short breaks are a difficult issue for disabled children and young people because they're the only service that you're likely to want in terms of social care that you can't get under the 1970 Act. The 1970 Act doesn't extend to the provision of accommodation. And if there's a crisis situation, then there will be a duty to provide short breaks to the family under Section 20 of the Children Act 1989, which uh, will result in the child having looked after status, but it's not uh, the same as being in care. Section 20 accommodation is voluntary and the parents can terminate that at any time. If it's not a crisis situation and the local authority doesn't choose to exercise one of the powers in Section 20, then we're back to Section 17 and, and Section 17 can be used to provide accommodation to disabled children, but it's not a specific duty. And so there's a, a, a gap in the law here, a lacuna, as the lawyers would say, because one of the most important services, residential short breaks, is perhaps the hardest uh, for families legally to obtain. And before we get on to the CARE Act and look at entitlements to parent carers of disabled adults, for parent carers of disabled children, those up to 18, there is a new entitlement following uh, the Children and Families Act to parent carers needs assessments, PCNAs, which have to be carried out either because the parent asks for one or because the local authority thinks that they would be needed. And so it's a very low bar for the assessment to take place. And thankfully, the assessments can be combined not just with child in need assessments, but also with young carers assessments for any siblings, for example, who might be providing care. And so what this scheme points towards, although it doesn't perhaps require as, as clearly as it should, is a joined up approach to assessment. And if you've got a disabled child and two parents, one of whom may themselves be disabled, and two siblings, one of whom is providing significant amounts of care, there will need to be a significant number of assessments done in relation to all those individuals. But what's really needed is a joined up approach and a holistic package of services that's going to support the family um, together. And that's what 
sadly, I, uh, too often I see is lacking until we get involved and start challenging failures to comply with certain duties. However, there isn't a duty as such to provide services to parent carers with disabled children, whereas there is now under the Care Act to parent carers of disabled adults or other family capable carers of disabled adults. What the local authority has to do under section 17ZF of the Children Act is consider the outcome of the parent carer's needs assessment and decide whether or not to provide services to the parent carer or the disabled child. And that really reinforces, I'd suggest, the need for a joined up decision making process, a holistic approach, a whole family approach to the package of care, because this decision has to look across the board, across the different members of the family. And then in terms of children up to 18 with complex health needs, and I mentioned the Haringey case earlier that shows that local authorities can't act as a substitute NHS for children. And so this national framework for children, it's actually called, sorry, Children and Young People's Continuing Care, you can change the title of the slide, um, has been published. It's non-statutory guidance, curiously, but it's generally followed, uh, looking at how complex cases should be dealt with. And that includes complexity in relation to behaviour and communication issues. And so actually this is applicable to perhaps rather more children up to 18 than it might be thought of. And it's a very quick, it's supposed to be a very quick process of assessing eligibility for continuing uh, care, children and young people's continuing care, no more than eight weeks. And then what happens next? Well, it's not entirely clear following the national framework, but I suggest that the, the difference that it should make for families is that the package of care where a child is eligible for continuing care will be led by the CCG, the, the local NHS body. But of course, there will still be local authority involvement, certainly in the form of education. And often we see joint packages of care between the CCG and the local authority um, where a child is eligible for continuing care. Now, that may not be right as a matter of law, looking at the Haringey case. It may be that the, the care should be 100% NHS funded, but that's probably a matter for the public bodies to deal with unless it's impacting on the, uh, the family and, the, and there's some kind of shortfall or deficiency in the amount of care. So a couple of questions about this. Uh, first of all, continuing care assessments are currently suspended, suspended because of COVID. Now, I think that's correct. They were suspended under the coronavirus act. I think they've restarted, but of course there'll be a backlog. But very, it's very important to find out how your local area is approaching both children and adults continuing care, because they will almost always be dealt with differently. And to find out who the lead person is in your local CCG to approach. And most of the time, Referrals for continuing care assessments are made by local authorities, but families can refer themselves, of course, if they think using perhaps the eligibility checklist that they are um, potentially eligible. Um, if a young person has continuing care funding, can social care stamp out of the picture completely at age of 18? Well, yes, they can, as we'll see, because it's very clear from the statutory framework for adult continuing care that there's an either or split. And so it may well be that post eight, once a person turns 18, their entire care and support is funded by the CCG. And it's very clear in both the frameworks for children and adults, that there needs to be very careful transition planning for um, disabled young people as they move from children to adults continuing care because of the different approaches um, pre and post 18. And a question that perhaps goes back to the um, short breaks slides about whether having an ordinary life includes being able to access work. And the answer is yes, of course it does. But the service that supports work, as the question suggests, is a different service, which is called childcare. And there are specific duties in relation to childcare for disabled children that run up to the age of 18 in the Child Care Act 2006. And there's, there's a post on my blog about that if you search rights and reality childcare. And so short breaks generally won't be available for uh, to support work. But it may well be the family need both. They need both short breaks to access life and childcare to access work. And it shouldn't have to be a choice uh, between the two. So that takes us into um, great detail of the EHC process. I think I'll cover that when we come back from our own break and also, as I promised, the um, issues around transition to adulthood through the Mental Capacity Act and the Care Act as well. So we'll just take a 15 minute break now if people could come back at 11.25, then I'll resume uh, from where we are and I'll pick up any, I'll try and pick up any questions that come in in the break or I may take them at the end 
depending on whether I think I'm about to cover them naturally in the slides as well. So thanks very much, everyone. And we'll now have our own short break until 11.25. the second half of the talk very pleased to be back and uh, I will as I said pick up questions a little later on but I want to get straight back into the main body of the uh, talk now so I'm going to share my screen again I was just at the point of beginning to describe the EHC process now that may well be familiar to many of you many of you may already have EHC plans for your son or daughter or may have them yourself for those who don't, of course, the, the gateway, um, if you need one, will be an EHC needs assessment under Section 36 of the Children and Families Act. And the key question at that stage is whether it might be necessary, the language of the legislation is that it may be necessary for special educational provision to be made in accordance with an EHC plan. And the two likely factors to take into account there is, might specialist provision be required in the form of a special school or college? In it, and if not, and it's, very clear that the young person is staying in mainstream might they need additional provision that's either particularly expensive or particularly complex and the benchmark figure is six thousand pounds a year but that's not a legal rule that's merely a, a guideline that can be taken into account and of course at this stage the question is just a, a, a might question is there a realistic possibility that this uh, that the plan might be needed and the vast majority of the time when local authorities refuse to assess that the tribunal overturns that decision if it's appealed. That's your first right of appeal as a parent or a young person. Certain specified advice and information must be obtained every time an EHC needs assessment is done. And then the decision becomes whether it is necessary for special educational provision to be made in accordance with the plan. So now we've got a yes, no answer um, on the balance of probabilities, of course. And one of the questions is whether the provision required could reasonably be provided from the resources that's normally available to maintain schools or colleges. That whole process must take no more than 20 weeks, as the Code of Practice helpfully uh, summarises. And people may well be familiar with these sections of the EHC plan, but just to recap, section A is the aspirations section, usually written by the young person or family. B to D is then the needs, education, health and care. E is the outcome section. Now that's really important for disabled young people because one of the key questions for um, deciding whether or not an EHC plan should continue to be main, maintained post-19 is whether the outcomes have been achieved. Now you don't have a right to appeal to the tribunal directly in relation to the outcomes, but the tribunal can amend the outcomes if it thinks it's appropriate to do so, if it allows an appeal in relation to the next section, section F, which is the special educational provision. So it's worth bearing that in mind if you are going to appeal to the tribunal. G is then the health provision. H is social care. And for those over 18, it will be all in H2 because H1 is just the Grantly Sick and Disabled Persons Act provision. And as we've seen, that only applies to children. I is then the school or college or other institution. If the, um, if the child or young person isn't attending an institution, then it should be left blank and J is any direct payment that's going to be made. Now, what's the point of all of this? In large part, it all comes down to section 42 of the Children and Families Act, which requires the local authority to secure the specified special educational provision for the child or young person and the CCG to arrange the specified health provision. And so that's a specifically enforceable duty that is owed to the individual child or young person with the EHC plan. But obviously it's, it's important for that duty to make sense that the plan is appropriately specified and quantified. So if it just says in section F that the young person will have access to speech and language therapy, then as long as the speech and language therapist has been anywhere near them in the previous year, then that's been complied with. Same for, with opportunities for small group learning. Um, there has to be much more focused, specific, targeted language, setting out clearly what's going to be done by whom and when, in order for the plan to then be enforced by your lawyers if, if it comes to that because otherwise the plan may as well um, not be written if it's going, only going to be extremely vague and general other than if a school or college is named in section i then section 43 of the children and families act requires them to admit in terms of placements the requested school or college must be named unless it's unsuitable for the child or young person 
it will be incompatible with the provision of efficient education for others for, for that child or young person to attend which goes beyond the school or college simply being full they have to show that there will be a significant impact on the provision of education for other children for one more child or young person to attend or it's incompatible with the efficient use of resources now it doesn't say section 39 that the college or the school costs more it says that it will be incompatible with the efficient use of resources for the child or young person to attend which means a, a, an additional cost that outweighs the additional benefit. And clearly any significant additional cost will be hard to justify if the local authority has a suitable alternative. And so very often if you're going to tribunal on this issue, you're having to try and show that what the local authority is proposing is unsuitable, won't meet the need, and therefore the tribunal should order the more expensive provision, which is suitable. Uh, these are the most difficult kinds of tribunal appeals, and it's those cases where specific advice will be needed as soon as possible from someone with relevant expertise. For example, on how to calculate the different placement costs because there are some technical rules in relation to that that I haven't got time to go into uh, today. Um, so a question about um, an appeal in relation to sections B, F and I, but the independent school that they prefer said no based on an entry assessment. Is there any chance of getting that school named in the EHC plan? Well, yes, there is a chance because the tribunal can order independent schools that are on the Secretary of State's approved list to be named in the EHC plans, even if they say no. But of course, the tribunals like to give very significant weight to the school's own view as to their own suitability. And so um, it's going to be extremely difficult, I'd suggest, to win that kind of appeal. But in principle, it's possible. A question a little earlier on, why is there not a single age to be classed as an adult? Well, yes, there is a single age to be classed as an adult. Um, a person is a child until their 18th birthday, and from their 18th birthday, they are an adult. The confusion comes because of this concept of being a young person, which is relevant to the Children and Families Act, because you're a young person, essentially, from when you turn 16. And it's also, although the term isn't used, relevant in the Mental Capacity Act, because the Mental Capacity Act applies from the age of 16 as well. So for 16 and 17 year olds, there are difficulties arising from the fact that they are children, as a matter of law, without doubt. The Children Act still applies, parental responsibility still applies. But they're also young people who have different entitlements under different bits of legislation. So I'm not saying there's, that there's uh, total clarity, but it is clear that you are a child until you turn 18. on to some of the points about seizing to maintain shortly. Um, so moving on, reviews and reassessments. Of course, EHC plans need to be kept up to date. It's pointless to have a plan that describes a six-year-old when the child is now 13 or even worse when the young person is 17. And so there must be an annual review of the plan. That's a duty on the local authority, although the school or setting must hold the meeting. And um, if there's been a significant change in circumstance, then you can have a reassessment. But I suggest that should be quite rare because really that means going back to the beginning of the process and can involve a significant amount of delay. Whereas if it's just a question of updating, that should be done through the annual review process. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour through um, how EHC plans work. Before I take some questions, I just wanted to show people what the code of practice says about uh, ceasing to maintain the EHC plans, because that's obviously going to be really important for me to the group that we're talking about. When is the EHC plan going to stop? Now, I'm going to search cease, and it takes me straight to ceasing an EHC plan in the code of practice, and the index is clickable. So there you go, right immediately, we're into um, the, the, the guidance on ceasing an EHC plan, which references section 45 of the Children and Families Act and these regulations within the main SEND regulations. And we're told that a local authority may cease to maintain an EHC plan only if it determines that it's no longer necessary for the plan to be maintained or if it's no longer responsible for the child or young person. And that could be either because they've got too old or because they've moved out of their area. Um, the circumstances where a local authority may determine that it's no longer necessary for an EHC plan to be maintained include, importantly, so this isn't definitive, where the child or young person no longer requires the special educational provision specified in the plan. In deciding that, the local authority must take account of whether the education and training outcomes specified in the EHC plan have been achieved. So there's my point about why section E is so important for young people, because if the outcomes have been achieved, 
local authority may say, right, plan no longer needed. But very importantly, local authorities must not cease to maintain the EHC plan simply because the young person is age 19 or over. So there can't be any kind of age cutoff. Um, these are the circumstances where the person is no longer responsible, the local authority is no longer responsible, leaving education to take up paid employment, because of course that would mean the EHC plan is no longer relevant if you're not in education. Going into higher education, um, no desire to engage in further learning or move to another area. I won't deal with these specific points about exclusion. That's relevant, obviously, for some individuals and will need to be looked at, or those given a custodial sentence. But this is generally relevant, 9205, where a local authority is considering ceasing to maintain an EHC plan. It must do these three things. Inform the child's parents or the young person, depending on whether they have the young person has capacity. Consult them and consult the school or institution. If it hasn't done that, the decision to cease to maintain the plan will be unlawful. And if they are going to cease to maintain it, they must notify all those people of that decision and of the right to appeal. And we'll come back to the importance of that in a moment. Um, so where that's happening, support should generally cease at the end of the academic year, which is very important. And importantly, uh, if the person, the young person reaches their 25th birthday before the course has ended, the HC plan can be maintained until the end of the academic year in which they turn 25, or the day that the apprenticeship or course ends, or the day before their 26th birthday. So it can continue at its latest until the day before the person's 26th birthday. Important that the exit from the EHC plan is planned carefully. I cannot stress this enough because it's such a substantial change in the young person's entitlements. We really do need to plan carefully any transitions away from the EHC plan. Um, adult services should be involved. And then importantly this, whether the child's parent or the young person disagrees, they may appeal to the tribunal. Local authorities must continue to maintain the EHC plan until the time has passed for bringing an appeal or where an appeal has been registered until it's been concluded. So if you disagree and think the plan should continue, then if you appeal, they have to keep the old plan in force. And when you appeal, you can, you can appeal not only against the decision to cease to maintain, but also against the contents of the plan to bring it up to date as well. So that's the key guidance on um, ceasing to maintain EHC plans. So before I move on to look at a uh, local offer, I'll just see if there are any other relevant questions that I should be picking up now. Um, why does um, the EHC plan cease in higher education? Because that's what Parliament decided. And I'm afraid as a lawyer, I can't say anything more than that. And when I said higher education, do I mean university? In short, yes. The definition is a little bit more complicated than that. But in practical terms, yes. Um, can the school and local authority write the outcomes in Section E without any input from the parents? Well, parents, of course, should receive the draft plan and be invited to comment on the whole thing. So no, in short, there should be an opportunity the parents to comment on the outcomes. Um, can the tribunal uh, make orders to name any independent schools that aren't on the approved list? Yes, in, potentially they can, but they can't require the school to accept the pupil if they're not on the approved list. So there would have to be a formal offer of a place from an independent school that's not on the approved list. How are social and health needs managed once a young person needs education? Well, in principle, the CARE Act will govern all social care needs and any health needs have to be met under the NHS Act. And if the person's got complex needs under the continuing health care framework, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, what's the system of support if a young person moves out of education and is under 25 and again post 25? Well, essentially, it's the CARE Act. So in most cases, we need to look at what I'm about to come on to, which is the CARE Act, to deal with um, support once the young person has left education. Um, if a local authority decides to seize a plan because they feel needs can be met in adult supported services, do you challenge that through the tribunal? Yes, generally you will, because that will be a decision to cease to maintain the plan, which is an appealable decision. Um, but if, if for some reason that isn't possible, then judicial review is always available as a backstop. But again, individual advice uh, will be needed. Um, a point about seizing a statement in 2015, I'm not going to deal with that, I'm afraid, because it's obviously um, about the old law, and we're now focusing on the new law, but I'm glad to see um, that you were able to get, uh, get it back in force. Um, and EHC plans can continue until 25, but local authorities don't allow more than two years. Very rare to get third years. 
Well, that may well be policy, but it's not law. As you've seen, I've just looked, shown you the section of the guidance on ceasing to maintain, H maintain the HC plan. It doesn't say anything about only having two years of provision. And so it needs to be challenged. And if there's a policy that's clear, whether it's written down or not, of only funding two years provision, then that could be challenged by way of judicial review. Otherwise, individual decisions to cease to maintain the HC plans because they've had two years in college uh, will have to be challenged by way of appeals to the tribunal. Um, how are social care and health integrated into the EHC plan? Well, the answer is not necessarily very well. I would suggest that EHC plans are basically still education documents with health and social care bolted on. And so, and also because of the provision that says that health and social care provision, which educates or trains becomes educational provision, it may be that in many cases, all the provision is actually in section F anyway. And so it's really important not to assume that just because your child's got an EHC plan or your young person's got an EHC plan, everything's going to be okay. You very much need to, to grapple with the social care and health law as well, and make sure that those processes are being followed if you're concerned that things aren't being done uh, properly. Um, so a question suggesting that uh, sick form colleges and schools say they don't provide one-to-one -one support. Well, if section F of the EHC plan mandates one-to-one -one support, then that must be provided. But of course, it's not the school or college that's responsible for the one-to-one -one support, it's the local authority. So any challenge would have to be to the local authority for failing to secure that provision. And um, the school, of course, may be guilty itself of failing to make reasonable adjustments or failing to comply with the section 66 duty that I showed you earlier. But the most obvious challenge will be to the local authority in that context. Um, a question about how long um, young people are able to stay in college. Can it be more than three years? Well, yes, absolutely it can. It can be until the day before their 26th birthday, as we've seen. Uh, the question is whether the, the EHC plan continues to be necessary and whether, the, um, whether there are educational outcomes that are still to be met and whether there's progress that can still be made. And the upper tribunal has very helpfully clarified that the kind of progress that might require an EHC plan to continue could be relatively small. It certainly doesn't require people being able to take credited examinations or anything like that but just that so they are continuing to be able to make progress in an educational sense uh, may um, result in the requirement for the EHC plan to continue up to the person's 26th birthday. Um, a point that actually goes to a case that I'm involved in, has it been decided yet, read a deadline for issuing amended EHC plans after an annual review? And the short answer is, that is no. So there's a, a problem with the regulations which is that they don't say on their face what the time limit is for completing an important step in the annual review process. And so in a case that I brought it against Devon County Council, and we were saying that the regulations had to be read in a way that did give a specified time frame. And Devon's argument was no, and it's just whatever we think is reasonable. Now the High Court decided it wasn't going to determine that claim because it had become academic. In, in other words, it wasn't relevant to those individuals anymore because they actually had EHC plans. We've appealed that decision um, to the Court of Appeal or we're seeking permission to appeal in any event and we're waiting for a decision on that. So I'm afraid the answer to your question um, is no, we don't yet know if there is a fixed deadline for issuing amended EHC plans after annual reviews. Okay, I'm going to move on because there's a lot more we need to cover um, in the 45 minutes or so we've got left. So back to the slides. Um, just mention the local offer, of course, because the majority of disabled children and young people won't have the HC plan. And so it is very important that local authorities take seriously this duty to publish information about provision that's available within and outside their area across education and social care. And also that people use the local offer comment facilities as a way to challenge in a, inadequate provision in particular areas, because local authorities are obliged to respond to any comments they receive generally about um, lack of services or inadequate services. And it may trigger a duty to review the provision under section 27 of the Children and Families Act if there's very clear evidence that there's a gap in provision in the local area. Now moving on then to issues around mental capacity, first of all, and decision-making for disabled children and young people. And another plug, I should say, that I think the chapter on decision-making in our handbook is absolutely brilliant. It's written um, by Camilla Parker, is a real expert in this area. We're very lucky to have her um, involvement in the book. And I find it incredibly useful um, in terms of understanding 
what is quite a complicated area of law. Um, and it's very important to bear in mind as well that decision making issues can arise for children too, because there's a concept of Gillick competence. A child can be Gillick competent to make their own decisions. And that refers to an old case about access to contraception. Uh, and if the child is able to understand uh, the, the relevant decision and um, make an informed choice, then they can have th their own decision making right. So, so decision making issues actually arise before the age of 16, but they're particularly prominent post 16 because the Mental Capacity Act applies to 16 and 17 year olds in almost all respects in the same way as it does to those over the age of 18. There's a particular tweak just to deal first of all in relation to the um, Children and Families Act because um, the scheme for the Children and Families Act says that if the young person can't decide for themselves whether to, for example, bring an appeal to the tribunal, their parents automatically get the right to do so on their behalf, as long as there's no appointed representative like a deputy. They can carry on bringing appeals and making decisions up to the age of 25. So there's a particular carve out there for parental rights continuing up to the age of 25 in relation to EHC plans. But the general approach is that set out in the Mental Capacity Act. And we start with the principles in section one of the act, which include the following. First of all, a, excuse me, a presumption of capacity. And so what that means is that no one should ever have to prove that they are able to make their own decisions. The burden is always on the person who's saying, no, they're not. They have to show that the presumption of capacity has been displaced. Also a principle that all practicable steps have to be taken to help a person make their own decisions before any decisions are taken on their behalf which is really important in terms of ensuring that disabled young people get access to appropriate support to improve and enhance their own decision-making ability. The right to make unwise decisions. This is really difficult, I think, particularly for disabled young people who are neurodivergent and who may make decisions that others think of as odd or unusual and um, or unwise, but they do understand what they're being asked to decide. And, they, and the test when we see it of capacity is met. So there's a thin line often between decision that's unwise and an incapacitous decision, but that line has to be respected and people are allowed to make choices that others would think of as, as um, not appropriate. We can't use the Mental Capacity Act to impose our values on others. Um, if the person lacks capacity, then all acts and decisions for them have to be taken in their best interests. But it's a two-stage process and very often people jump to this concept of best interest decision-making before they've thought carefully enough about whether the person in fact has capacity to make their own decisions. Because if someone has capacity, best interests are irrelevant. They can do things that are not best for them, like all of us can. Uh, so we only get to best interests once there's been a clear finding, or at least um, in the Court of Protection, you might have an interim finding, but the person lacks capacity, and then we move on to think about best interests. And then finally, a requirement or what's described as the least restrictive option to be chosen of the person's rights and freedoms. Um, so some more EHCP questions that I'll come back to if I have time, but I do want to make sure we get onto the CARE Act as well, so I'm going to carry on. Um, so the general approach to mental capacity in section two of the Mental Capacity Act. A person lacks capacity in relation to a matter if at the material time they're unable to make a decision for themselves in relation to that matter because of an impairment of or disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain. So first of all, capacity is decision specific in relation to that matter. And secondly, it's time specific if at the material time, people's capacity to make decisions will change over time. For some it will improve, for some it will get worse. And so there does need to be um, careful consideration of capacity at the relevant time in relation to the relevant decision. That doesn't mean, of course, that we spend every minute of every day assessing capacity, that would be absurd. But if there are significant decisions to be taken, it's very important that old assessments of capacity aren't, aren't just used and relied on. There has to be a timely assessment in relation to that specific decision. And what does it mean to be unable to make a decision for yourself? Well, section three of the Act says that being unable to make the decision includes being able to understand the information or being unable to use or weigh up that information. And that's where I think the, the thin line between um, an unwise decision and an incapacitous decision gets uh, even thinner because someone might think that a person is unable to use or weigh up the information, whereas in fact they can, they're just making a decision that others don't agree with. 
So it's very important that that question of the user way up is, um, is assessed carefully. And the Code of Practice for the Mental Capacity Act makes clear that a wide range of people can carry out capacity assessments. It doesn't always have to be doctors. Social workers, for example, in appropriate cases, can assess capacity. And then Section 4 of the Act gives us a significant amount of detail about how best interest decisions are to be made if the person lacks capacity. Two things that I'll pick up, uh, and they do in fact go to questions or points that have been made. The first is that the person's own views are central to any assessment as to what is best for them. And that was made really clear by Baroness Hale, the former president of the Supreme Court, in David James's case, Aintree Hospitals and James. And from since James, it's been really clear that although we don't just rely on what the person wants because they've assessed at this point they lack capacity, we do treat their views and their wishes and feelings with very great significance. And it may well be that what's best for them is what is in accordance with what they themselves want or, or would have wanted. So that's point one. The second point is the best interest decision making shouldn't be used to cut out family members or, or loved ones from the decision making process. And it's very concerning, and we've seen some of this on the questions, if families are told, oh, well now Johnny's turned 16, or sometimes 18, as if that's magically changed things. Um, you don't get to decide anymore, we do. That's not how it works. It's supposed to be a collaborative decision-making process. And those who are concerned with P's welfare or, or engaged in caring for P, the Act always describes the disabled person as P, um, must be consulted unless there's a good reason not to, I would suggest. Um, it's not the exact language of the Act, but I think when you take into account um, Article 8 of the European Convention, that may well be the right approach. And so um, we shouldn't see family members cut out of the equation, quite the opposite. There should be a collaborative decision-making process. And this is a point where I should perhaps introduce the concept of becoming a deputy, because families often understandably think, well, hang on a second, can't I get the right to make decisions for my adult child? And the answer is yes, you potentially can, either in relation to their property and affairs, or, and or, because you can get both, in relation to their health and welfare. And property and affairs is relatively straightforward to get if there's good reason to, uh, in terms of managing money or assets. Health and welfare is more challenging. Um, a case a couple of years ago showed that there's no test of exceptionality um, for the appointment of a, of a welfare deputy, but there still has to be a good reason why they should be appointed. And um, that may not be always obvious. And also, if your reason that you want to be appointed as a deputy is because you're in a disagreement with the local authority, that's precisely when the court will be least likely to want to do it. Because it's not, it doesn't want to use to see deputyship being used to get the upper hand in the dispute over a public body. The court is much happier um, for disputes around best interest to come to the court and be decided by a judge of the court of protection, rather than appointing a deputy to decide those issues. So where I have had the deputy appointed, was in a case where a young person um, with autism needed a series of health interventions. And everyone agreed that the mother, as it was in that case, was best placed to decide to weigh up the pros and cons. And it was much quicker and more efficient for her to be the deputy than for those disputes or those issues, there weren't necessarily disputes, to come back to the court each time. So that's the kind of situation where the court will, I think, be quite happy to appoint a deputy. But in other situations where there's evidence of conflict, the court will um, think very carefully, generally, before making an order for deputyship. Now the difference between deputyship and uh, attorneyship is that um, you become a, an attorney if someone appoints you, someone gives you that decision-making right, gives you power of attorney. And of course, most disabled young people won't have capacity to give away decision-making rights. Some do and can, those with mental health problems, for example, whose capacity fluctuates, but others, for example, those with a, a severe learning disability won't have decision-making capacity at the point they turn 16. And so instead, the um, decision-making that's relevant is deputyship. A uh, question about getting a copy of the PowerPoint slides. Yes, they will be circulated, as I understand it, by uh, the Seashell Trust. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so one other important thing to bear in mind in terms of, two other important things to bear in mind in terms of mental capacity issues. First of all, um, the Section 5 defence, so I've just taken you through Sections 1 to 5 of the Act very briefly, and this is how most decisions and acts actually get taken or, or done for people who lack capacity. 
Um, Section 5 creates a general defence, as it's described, from liability for either criminal prosecution or, or civil liability. If you reasonably believe that a person lacks capacity in relation to a particular act or decision, and you reasonably believe that what you're doing is in their best interest, and this defence is available to parent carers, but also to any others, professionals or others who may be um, doing things for disabled people. But note the word reasonably that's used twice here. So you can't just assume that either that the person lacks capacity or that what you're doing is best for them. Your beliefs in those regards must be reasonable, which means that they're informed by some evidence. And so that's why I'd suggest, and certainly in relation to significant decisions, not what colour socks someone's going to be wearing, but certainly where they're going to live or something of that nature, uh, a capacity assessment will be important from a relevant professional with relevant expertise. And then the final point on the slide is the area probably that's had the most controversy and the most interest, but it, but it can, I think, be something of a, a red herring, which is around deprivation of liberty. Now, of course, deprivation of liberty is hugely important. It's a fundamental human right in Article 5, of the European Convention that no person should be deprived of their liberty unless one of the exceptions apply. And the problem um, is that many disabled people will be cared for in circumstances that amount to the objective element of a deprivation of liberty. In other words, they're not free to leave and they're subject to continuous supervision and control. And in the Supreme Court case of Cheshire West, it was made clear that that is a deprivation of liberty in the same way as it would be for anybody else. And that's not necessarily unlawful. It just needs to be authorised. And that's where the problem comes in. How are we going to authorise these deprivations of liberty and make sure that they're appropriate? Well, for certain settings, we can use the doles, the deprivation of liberty safeguards. And those are hospitals and care homes, as long as the person is aged 18 or above. But that's a problem, of course, both, both for 16 and 17 year olds and younger children, but also for those who are not in hospital or care homes, which is a large number of disabled young people, of course, many of whom might be living in supported living arrangements. And in those cases, any deprivation of liberty has to be authorised by the Court of Protection. And we have what's described as the re-ex procedure that follows a Court of Appeal case. It's supposed to be a streamlined approach. But even with that, there's still a massive backlog of applications. And I would suggest in many cases, applications just simply haven't been made, even if it's obvious that the person's deprived of their liberty and that they haven't consented to it or they're not able to consent to it and that the state are involved, which are the other parts of the test. So that's significant and it needs to be addressed. But I would also suggest that there has perhaps been an excessive focus on deprivation of liberty issues because it's so hard edged. And what often gets lost in conversations about deprivation of liberty and whether or not a person is deprived of their liberty, and if so, whether it should be authorised. And their wider human rights, in particular Article 8, and the right to respect for private life and the person's physical and, and psychological integrity and their well-being and so on. And so I think it's really important that we don't um, just get completely focused on deprivation of liberty issues, but think of the, the wider spectrum of um, human rights concern. So a question, um, how do you become a deputy for an 18-year-old? Uh, the answer is you apply to the Court of Protection. And I would suggest it's worth getting advice before you do that. You can do it on your own, but it would be uh, sensible, I suggest, to get some specialist advice, perhaps from a solicitor, as to um, how to frame the application so that you've got the greatest chance of it being accepted. So that's the Mental Capacity Act, and that leaves me with about 30 minutes to do the CARE Act, which is um, just about doable. So I'm going to crack straight on with that. And the CARE Act, of course, in force from April 2015. So we've had it for quite a while now. Um, and what it did was it swept away all the old law on adult community care and left the currently sick and disabled persons act in force for children, as we've seen, creating a new scheme for adult care. And importantly, for our purposes, a series of new duties around transition to adulthood as well. And we've got a single suite, I've described it, of regulations and a single guidance document. But there's lots of different sets of regulations within this care and support suite and the, the statutory guidance i think if you printed it out it would run to hundreds of pages so it's not a straightforward scheme but it is at least all in one place as opposed to um the, the previous the previous situation where unless you bought luke clement's book you basically would have no idea what the law was or where to find it um, so how does the care act start it starts with section one as you'd expect with what's described as the well-being duty 
And what the, what the wellbeing duty does is it answers the question, what's the point of adult social care? And it's clearly not just, as one judge once said to me, to keep people safe. That's an aspect of, of what social care is about, but it's not the whole thing. The whole thing is what's described as the promotion of well-being. Um, and so everything that local authorities do under the Care Act is supposed to be geared towards the promotion of the individual's well-being. And what does well-being include? Well, importantly, I suggest it includes their own personal dignity, their own sense of themselves. And the Act says that the starting point is the individual is best placed to judge their own well-being. And the guidance suggests that this all comes quite close to incorporating Article 19 of the, of the CRPD, which we saw earlier, into English law. I think that's a bit of a stretch because Article 19 is much more specific. It's, it says very specifically there is a right to independent living and community inclusion, whereas the well-being duty is a, a, a more general duty to ensure that what's done promotes the individual's well-being. They're not the same thing, although they are perhaps coming from the same place and the well-being duty goes some way towards implementing um, what Article 19 would require. Another key duty in the Care Act to flag at the start, and this is particularly important, I think, for local groups, is what's described as the market shaping duty. And, and I think it's very in interesting to just reflect here on the debate around private sector involvement in the NHS, which is hugely controversial, of course. Whereas for adult social care, it's now the whole thing because local authorities are not expected to provide any adult social care services themselves at all. I mean, they can if they want to, but there's no requirement for them to do so. What's required, as we see, is for them to promote the efficient and effective operation of a market in services for meeting care and support needs. And they have to achieve uh, the outcome that's at the bottom of the slide, which is that people have a variety of high quality providers to choose from and sufficient information to make an informed choice. That concept of a variety of high quality provision is really important, I think, and again goes to Article 19 in terms of people having choices equal to others about where they live, where they live, and in this context, uh, where and who they get care and support from. So in terms of transition into the Care Act scheme, what the Care Act does is impose this whole series of different duties to carry out transition assessments in relation to disabled children, to their carers, and to young carers. And so the whole uh, approach is that by the time the, the child turns 18, it's clear whether or not they and those around them are going to be eligible for services under the CARE Act. So the timing of the assessment is critical. I'd suggest it should be around 16 or perhaps very early on once the person's turned 17, but significantly before their 18th birthday so that eligibility can be properly determined um, once they turn 18. Now, importantly, if that isn't done, or if there's a good reason why services should continue post-18, they must now so continue. And that's Section 66 of the Care Act, which inserts these new provisions into the children's social care duty, the effect of which is that children's services now have to continue post-18 until the full Care Act process has been completed. And so that's really important because what it brings an end to, in law at least, is any kind of cliff edge where the child falls off children's services because they've turned 18, but adult services isn't ready for them. If that's what happens now, the law says that children's services have to continue. What about if you haven't had social care as a child? And many children won't, of course, have needed social care input because their needs are being met by a combination of their family and school, particularly those in special schools or residential special schools. And then they turn 18 and, uh, or, or their EHC plan ends when they've finished uh, further education, they will now suddenly need social care involvement. The threshold, happily, for an assessment under the Care Act is set very low. It's merely that there's some appearance of need for care and support in relation to a disabled person or support in relation to a carer. And that's a very low bar indeed. You may as well, I'd suggest, just be on request. The assessment has to focus on the person's well-being, section one, and on what outcomes matter to them. And importantly, assessments of carers need to include consideration of whether they're willing to continue to provide care. Now that's striking, I think, because of course parents of disabled children have parental responsibility for them, and so the presumption is that they will provide care with support. But there is no such thing as an equivalent of parental responsibility for an adult even if that adult is your son or daughter. And so it's a choice in law 
as to whether you carry on caring for your adult son or daughter. And that's why the assessment has to look at this question and whether you're willing to do so. So it should be a very different kind of conversation than the conversations that take place around children's services, I would suggest. One of the things the assessment is supposed to do is give the local authority the information it needs to decide whether the person is eligible for care and support or support for care. And the eligibility criteria are set out in regulations. So they're national criteria. Local authorities have to apply the same criteria across the country. The first of them is that the, for the disabled pe person is that their needs arise from or are related to a physical or mental impairment or illness, usually quite straightforward. Then as a result of those needs, they have to be unable to achieve two or more outcomes, which range from things like getting yourself dressed to caring for children, engaging in work and so on. And unhelpfully, perhaps, the regulation uses the language of unable, but in fact, the definition section make clear that you're unable to do something just if you uh, take longer to do it than someone else, or if you can't do it without support, or if it causes you pain, comfort, or distress. So in fact, it should really say, I suggest find, you find it difficult to achieve these outcomes. So that's the second stage. And then the final stage is that as a consequence of all this, there has to be a significant impact on your well-being. And significant isn't defined. So it just means, I'd suggest, more than a minor or a trivial impact. So the bar isn't set that high. And most disabled young people I have met will be eligible for support under the CARE Act if they're um, the subject of a proper assessment and then these eligibility criteria are properly applied. Uh, so a question, how, do you, how and to whom do you request, request a care assessment? Well, that will be the adult social care team within your local authority. And there should be a gateway. There should be a telephone number and probably a website that you can go to to make that request. But that's really a matter of, of policy and practice rather than a matter of law. Uh, if there isn't an obvious way for you to do it, then that's unlawful. But how exactly the local authority arranges itself is up to uh, the local authority. Um, is that why local authorities are keen to get young people into adult social care? Well, I think it's fair to say that, it's, that the, the statutory scheme expects transition at 18, unless there's a good reason for the child to remain in children's services. So the vast majority of cases, people should move on to adult social care on their 18th birthday. Section 66 is just a safety net in case that's not appropriate in a particular case, or the process has failed and things haven't been done in the right time. Um, adult social care are assessing parents over the phone about their young people, asking specific questions without telling them they're being assessed and then refusing to support them. Well, that's, that's uh, problematic, I would suggest, at best. Uh, it's not, in my view, lawful to carry out an assessment by stealth. For an assessment to be lawful, people would need to know that they're being assessed. And also for disabled young people, they would need, the social services would need to assess the disabled young person, not just the carer. Now, telephone assessments are possible if they're appropriate in the particular case. There's no fixed definition of how you have to carry out, how to carry out a care act assessment. Uh, but it has to be appropriate for the circumstances of the individual person. And so if the disabled person has got complex needs, then of course the telephone assessment may well be inappropriate. So I would say anyone in that authority or any other authority adopting a similar approach should get advice. Um, if a young person has continuing care, do they, don't, do they not still have to have social care involvement? In, uh, in other words, a named social worker? No, uh, there is no requirement for anyone to have a named social worker. That's not a legal entitlement or requirement. And if a, an over 18 is eligible for continuing health care, there may well be no social care involvement in their package at all. Um, can you get free support to become a deputy? I'm not sure, I'm afraid. I'm not aware of any sources of free uh, support in terms of the Mental Capacity Act. Maybe that others are or that local agencies know, but I know that in, in many cases, um, people do approach solicitors for advice. I'm not sure even if that advice is um, something that can be covered by legal aid, but you can ask, of course, the legal aid solicitors if they're able to um, provide advice in that way. My, my hunch is that it isn't, but as a barrister, I'm thankfully not on the front line of having to deal with the legal aid agency, and so I'm not sure exactly what the requirements are there. But yes, I, I accept that um, it's a challenge to get free advice in relation to Mental Capacity Act issues. Um, can you appeal? Um, care decisions or refusal to provide care. No, you can't. There's no tribunal under the CARE Act. Now, if you've got an EHC plan, 
as part of the national trial, if you're appealing in relation to the education provision, you could also ask the tribunal to make recommendations in relation to care. But bear in mind, that's only if you're appealing the education issues, and also that those recommendations are non-binding and that the local authority doesn't have to do what the tribunal recommends anyway. And so it may well be that actually these are the kinds of cases where judicial review is a more appropriate and uh, more effective um, remedy. Um, how can we make sure that assessments are equally assessing mental health as well as physical disabilities? That's a great question. Uh, it's very important, of course, that assessments are appropriate and tailored for the individual. And that's what the, this care and support statutory guidance says. If they aren't, then the remedy, the legal remedy, is judicial review. And I have judicially reviewed assessments in the past that have been um, obviously unlawful. And so it would be well worth trying to get legal advice. Of course, we don't want to be judicially reviewing assessments. It's, it's a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut, potentially. And so hopefully local conversations can, can avoid that. But in the end, and of course, bear in mind that you can't wait too long because you, otherwise you'll find you're out of time. You've only got a maximum of three months to challenge the assessment. Um, judicial review is the remedy. OK, so moving on again, I'll come back to some more questions if there are time. There's time. What happens next? So you've had an assessment and you've had a decision that you're you've got some eligible needs. The CARE Act works very differently to the Currently Sick and Disabled Persons Act because it doesn't define a list of services and say, right, work out whether it's necessary to provide one or more of those services. It simply says to local authorities under sections 18 and 20, you must meet the needs. So once you've identified eligible needs, local authority, you have a duty to meet them. But section eight of the Act simply sets out a list of examples of ways in which needs can be met through the provision of accommodation, for example, in a care home or otherwise, but also through domiciliary care or in any other way. So it's a flexible duty that's designed to promote creative uh, responses. And the way in which the needs are going to be met has to be worked out through the care and support plan. So after the assessment, the second key document under the Care Act is the care and support plan. Now, if the child has an EHC plan, of course, you'd hope that there will be a significant read across between the two. But the Care and Support Plan can and should be a standalone document. It's, it's a Care Act document. It's got nothing to do with the Children and Families Act. And that's perhaps where the schemes don't um, work together as well as they could. So the Care and Support Plan is key. Um, it's something that has to be developed with the disabled person and any family member. And it has to ultimately set out the way in which needs are going to be met, which may well be through a direct payment, as we'll come on to. And there have, there's a duty on the local authority to take all reasonable steps to agree the care and support plan. But if ultimately they can't agree it with the disabled person, it's their decision, the local authority's decision as to what goes in the plan. And if you don't like it, the remedy would be judicial review. Now, in many cases, perhaps most cases, what you'll get as a result of a care act assessment and eligibility decision is a direct payment. But direct payments, first of all, are a choice. You can choose not to have a direct payment. You can say, I don't want to be an employer. I want to ma have a package of services, please. And also, you don't have a right to a direct payment because in, in each case, whether you have capacity or not to manage it, um, the final condition is whether the local authority thinks that it's an appropriate way to meet your needs. So although most of the time, if you want a direct payment, you can have one because that's what local authorities are geared up to do. It's not an absolute entitlement. The amount of the direct payment has to be calculated by reference to the costs of meeting your needs, i.e. providing the services. So there was a, an approach that was very popular for a while um, called the use of RAS's resource allocation system, which was an attempt to calculate a sum of money based solely on the needs. The difficulty with that is that money might not actually be enough to buy the services that you require. And so the Supreme Court in uh, the case of KM um, said that they can, local authorities can use RAS as a, as a ready reckoner to give an estimate, but ultimately there has to be a calculation of how much money is sufficient for the individual um, disabled person or perhaps carer. Charging, hugely important issue. Most local authorities, the vast majority of local authorities, don't charge for children's social care, although they could do. There's a statutory power to charge. Conversely, the vast majority of local authorities do charge for adult social care. I think Hammersmith and Fulham is the most notable exception. Um, they have a power now to charge for all kinds of care, both residential and non-residential. And if they are going to charge, 
then they must assess the person's ability to pay by reference to including their minimum income requirement. People have to be left with enough money to live on uh, in accordance with what the state has calculated. And so there are some very complicated rules on charging that are set out in some of the annexes to the care and support statutory guidance about what has to be taken into account and what has to be disregarded and so on. And this concept of disability related expenditure that people may be aware of, that, uh, which again results in a disregard from your charging. If you are concerned about charging, again, very much need to get case specific advice um, from one of the advice agencies. I should have mentioned, for example, Mencap and, and Acts, the Access Charity that provides specific advice about adult social care. Um, because charging is so complicated, it so often goes wrong in my experience, and it is well worth querying and challenging charging decisions. And one of the reasons why adult continuing health care is so important is because of charging, because CHC, NHS care, is free. And so even if the person has very complex needs and requires a very uh, significant amount of support, they will get that care free of charge if they go across the line and have a primary health need. Whereas if they're under the line and they are only eligible for local authority care through the CARE Act, they will almost certainly be charged um, for that care. So that's a, a key reason why families of disabled young people might want to push for an eligibility decision in relation to continuing health care. Um, some questions about PIP, personal independence payments. Um, that's a, a question that's really outside the scope of today's talk because it, it's a, PIP is a welfare benefit. There are very good advice agencies on welfare benefits, uh, Disability Rights UK, for example, um, and indeed law centres and other advice agencies can help with PIP issues, uh, but I'm not, I'm afraid I'm going to be able to cover those points uh, today. Um, anything else I need to deal with there? No, I think not, I'll carry on. So to, talk, to fill the final piece of the jigsaw in, I hope, um, how does continuing healthcare work for young people once they've reached the age of 18? This is where we get the national framework for continuing healthcare and, and NHS funded nursing care, which is statutory guidance, links to some directions that are issued under some NHS regulations. Uh, and the latest version uh, is enforced from October 2018. And the question that, that um, the framework is aimed at answering is whether the individual has a primary health need. And that means that their needs are of a sufficient intensity, the nature of the needs and so on is such that they are really health needs and that they should be met by the NHS. And so what the National Framework for Adults says very clearly is that there's an either or split. So if you are eligible for NHS continuing healthcare, if you're eligible for CHC, then the National Framework says that all of your health and associated care needs including the provision of accommodation if required, is to be met by the NHS. And that's why there may well be no room or need for uh, local authority involvement at all in a care package for a person um, who is eligible in that way. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, you're only going to get health services because the, what, what happens there is that the CCG has to take on the social work function and deliver a full package of services, including to meet social needs. CCGs are often concerned about that, I think it's fair to say, it's not their area of primary expertise, and they may well then contract with the local authority to help them or with an independent provider, but it's their legal responsibility, and they have to fund it subject to any other local arrangement. And, um, and the important point is it will be free of charge, and so it's a, it's a very valuable entitlement potentially for disabled young people. Now, in practical terms, I think there's an, another advantage to CHC funding, which is that the NHS is used to funding larger packages of care. And therefore, if a person has complex needs and is going to require um, significant costly services, the NHS may be more willing to pay. Conversely, as I've mentioned, the NHS tends to take a more medical approach. And so if what's needed is, is a more social and more flexible package of support, that may be, um, you may find more resistance there than you would from a local authority. But in fact, it's just a question of law as to what, and a question of fact as to whether the person is eligible for continuing health care or not. I suppose the question is, is, are you going to push for it if you're a family member? And, and it may well then depend on whether you're happy with the local authority support and whether you are concerned about charging. Um, if the CCG doesn't need to do a care needs assessment, how do they know the person's needs beyond health? Well, that's a really good question. The um, domains of the uh, continuing healthcare assessment do go beyond 
strict health needs, as I say, in, for example, in relation to behaviour. But I think it is fair to say that the information that the NHS has will tend to be more medically focused. But it is important that there is a multidisciplinary assessment as part of the eligibility process. And that should involve, of course, consideration of any um, assessments that have been done by children's services or indeed by adult services, any independent reports that there might be, there should be a full, a full spectrum review of the evidence base. But it is, I think, a valid point that in the absence of a kind of detailed assessment like would be done under the CARE Act, um, the understanding of social needs might not be as great if the person is eligible uh, for CHC. Um, question about well, what can be done given the suspension of continuing healthcare? As I say, I thought that the suspension had been lifted um, during the autumn. If I'm wrong about that, then it is very difficult. And of course, the Coronavirus Act um, was designed to deal with the, the national emergency created by the pandemic and um, other things have been put on the back burner and um, what i would say is that local authorities and ccgs are still required to act rationally and reasonably uh, as a matter of common law and if there's a serious negative impact on disabled young people um, then something needs to be done and if nothing is done and the person's just left in limbo that could well be the kind of thing that the administrative court would uh, consider by way of an application for judicial review um, a question of um, whether continuing healthcare would include medications that are required for ADHD, for example. Um, it's unlikely that a person with ADHD would, alone would qualify for continuing healthcare. Uh, if, however, you have a primary health need and one of your needs is ADHD, then yes, the treatment of that condition would be the responsibility of, of the NHS. And indeed, of course, medication would always be the responsibility of, NHS, of the NHS through your GP in any event. Um, can a young person have both an education, health and care plan and CHC funding? Yes, absolutely. And indeed many will, will because of course the majority of the additional funding that comes through an EHC plan will be education funding, will fund the, the college placement, for example, and the health element will be funded by the CCG and that will discharge their continuing healthcare uh, duties. Who's responsible for starting and completing the transition process? Well, that's a great question. And I think the fact that I can't give a straightforward answer to that perhaps demonstrates some, one of the issues with, uh, with the law, which has attempted to be more joined up, certainly since the 2014 reforms, but it's still a long way away from perhaps what we would want. Um, if, it's, if the person has an EHC plan, the answer must be the local authority, because that's the statutory requirement. But if there's no EHC plan, it's much more difficult. And I would suggest that what, in that situation, the family needs to be, take the initiative to make sure there's appropriate transition planning around social care and health if there is a, a degree of health need. Um, ah, a, a very important question around children and young people with tracheostomy being refused a return to school or the same thing would be young people at college as a result of the pandemic. Is that lawful? Well, no, it's not if it's happening because there's very clear guidance that says that um, aerosol generating procedures can be uh, carried out in schools and there's guidance as to how to do it. Now I know in practical terms it may be that schools can't get hold of appropriate PPE, personal protective equipment and so on, but as a matter of law um, there's a real issue around discrimination there if uh, children are being denied access to education and also there may be a failure to secure the provision in the EHC plan as well, so those decisions definitely need to be challenged. Um, can an education, health and care plan be used to help with support in employment? Well, indirectly, yes, in that it can be used to require funding for education that can support the person to, to gain the skills they need into employment, but not to help the person literally work. Uh, and that's where you'd probably need to look at the access uh, to work scheme. Just looking at the, um, the chat to see if there's anything that uh, I need to do it here. I think that's all been dealt with. Thank you, uh, Simon. Um, so looking at, again, at another couple of questions. Who's responsible for fulfilling the EHCP duty when the child is shielding or self-isolating? So um, the concept of shielding is suspended at the moment. And so the government's position is that all children and young people can go back to school or college. Now, of course, if there's individual, that may be a different thing. Um, but the vast majority of children and young people is expected that EHC plan, if it names a school or college, will be delivered at the school or college. 
if they're self-isolating for a period because someone in the class has, has um, had a positive test or they themselves have symptoms, then I, in my view, it's the local authority that would have to do its best to secure the provision at home in the intervening period. Uh, if it's a very short period, of course, that may not be necessary, but certainly for you know, a week or more, which it may well be, um, it's not appropriate just to leave children at home uh, without any provision. So in short, the duties in relation to EHC please are always with local authorities in relation to educational provision uh, and social care, but that's, that's through the currently sick and disabled persons act. And they're, in, in, uh, they're there on CCGs in relation to health provision. There's a request for a name of an upper tribunal case, one of the upper tribunal cases I cited in relation to where progress can be minimal but still counted. I'm afraid I fail that test because I don't have the combination of letters to hand. But I think it is one of the ones we've written up for the CDC um, case law updates. And that's another thing I should mention before we end. So on the Council for Disabled Children website, there's a series of case law updates, which we try to keep up to date to summarise the key decisions of the higher courts and the upper tribunal. Um, in this area, and uh, it may well be that you can find the answer to that question uh, there. Right, so I think that's going to take us on to the conclusion of today's talk. I hope it's been helpful for everyone. Um, these conclusions will be familiar if you've seen one of my talks before. I think that um, this is the first point to make, is that there's very little that's wrong with the law as it currently stands. The law facilitates and in many ways requires good practice by professionals, by public bodies. But in order to deliver these legal entitlements, it's very important that the local area has allocated sufficient resources to send services. Now, of course, the local areas will say, well, hang on a minute, what are we getting from the centre? And there may well not be enough. And I've been involved in challenges, legal challenges in that regard. But even there, even so, taking that into account, local areas still have a degree of discretion as to where they allocate funds, as to where they prioritise. And in order to deliver effective provision, SEND has to be a priority. Um, and so I think there is a real opportunity, even though the financial position of local areas is probably getting worse as a result of the pandemic. Because there are such clear duties in our area, that even if they are driven, local areas, to only doing what they have to do as a matter of law, we have some of those core duties, where particularly where children and young people have the benefit of EHC plans, but also under the CARE Act or under the continuing healthcare framework, uh, those duties can arise. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope it's been helpful and I'm, I'm glad I was able to answer a good, a good number of questions, over 60 by the looks of things. I'm sorry I haven't been able to answer every single one. Um, thank you very much for those excellent questions. And uh, I wish you all the best in trying to make the law uh, a reality for your own young people and for others in the area as well. Um, these are my contact details. And um, if you email me about a case, I'm probably just going to send you back the list of solicitors on my blog. So it might be quicker to just search rights and reality solicitors, unless there's a particular reason why you think you need to bring the case uh, to my attention. I do tweet about this stuff all the time, so if you use Twitter, it would be lovely to connect with you there at Steve Broach, and there's the web address uh, for the blog as well, which has, I think, resources about pretty much everything I've spoken about today. And the easiest way to find anything on the blog is probably just to search rights and reality as one phrase, and then the thing you're interested in, including a list of solicitors if people need to get legal advice. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks um, to the CISO Trust for putting this on and for hosting this and the previous event as well. Really excellent um, for uh, them to put this on and make it available for everyone around the country too. Uh, I've enjoyed them very much. I hope it's been useful and uh, hopefully we'll do it again soon. Thanks very much, everyone.